just let's open up in prayer because I'm going to need prayer for this sermon and the next sermon. They're getting harder and harder this series, and it's getting tougher for me to bring them. So I'm just committed to the Lord, Heavenly Father. I do thank you for your Son. And Lord, we will never truly understand him. We will never truly understand the great gift, the great sacrifice, until we see him face to face. But Lord, we do just look to you now and give you thanks for your son and that that, that sacrifice which made it possible for us to be here. I thank you for your word and Lord, how you use your word. And I thank you that's your promise that your word, when it goes out, will not come back to you void. And so, Father, I just pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would take whatever you need from here, use it and, you know, to glorify your Son, Jesus Christ, and help us to know him better, to know you better, and to walk in the power and the understanding of the Holy Spirit in these days. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. So as you all probably know by now, we're talking about the Bema seat. I haven't mentioned the Bema seat for a while, but it's... It's just the place where when we come before the Lord, when we come face to face with him, he will ask us to just give, um, we'll just come before him and just pour out our whole life before him and say, well, uh, yeah, what did I do with your salvation? And in that we will be judged. We'll be judged for reward or we'll be judged for loss. We're not going to lose our salvation, but there seems to be some sort of a reward system up there, which we'll find out what it's all about towards the end of the series, hopefully. (laughs) Some of you might be walking around with big crowns and others might be walking around with little crowns. I don't know, (laughs) but we'll, we'll actually get to that. So this one is how effectively do we control our old nature? And I was going to try and hope to do it in one sermon. It's impossible. I'm going to take two sermons on this because I've got to lay the foundation to yeah what I want to talk about is how we walk in the spirit. So we'll start with ha- at have a look uh, having a look at our old nature. In 1 Corinthians 9:24 uh, to 27 Paul says this. Do you not know that in a race all runners run but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. We heard that last time. Everyone who competes in the race, sorry, in the games, goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone who's running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer who is beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be, dis- sorry, will not be dis- disqualified from the prize. So Paul knew that there was some sort of a prize and he didn't want to lose it. And the last time we looked at the race and the emphasis on running the race was to get to the finish, to make sure that we all finished and how we run the race, just how important it is. But when we start to to look at our old nature, it is probably one of the greatest fights that we all have. It starts when we are first born again and it continues until we die. And every one of us here have to battle with our old nature. And different people do it different way. And so I was going to take at least two sermons to cover this. We read in Romans chapter 7, Paul trying to come to grips with this. And we all know about Paul's struggle with trying to fulfill the new nature and deal with the old nature. And Paul struggles about this. He says, I try and do the things that I do and I don't end up doing them and vice versa. And we all know what that's all about. And you don't have to read Romans because when you first become a young Christian, you are born again and you feel different. But then it doesn't take long for you to wake up one day and and realise that you've still got the old nature hanging around in the background. 
And so from that day forward, there seems to be this conflict between the old nature and the new nature. Now, the two natures are different, and I just want to look at them. Every unbeliever has only one nature, and that nature is his and comes from all the way back from Adam. In other words, sin and that nature has been handed down to each and every one of us. Whether you like it or not, you've got it, it's yours. Get used to it and start to do something about it. But the Bible says of a person who has only got the one nature, the man without the spirit. And there is the key to, the, to, to how we're going to go forward in this. The ungenerated man is the man without the spirit. The regenerated man is the one with the spirit. When a believer believes and is born again, he receives a completely new nature. I repeat that, he receives a completely new nature. And that comes from Jesus Christ himself. Have I lost anybody yet? Don't worry, I'm going to lose quite a few. I'm going to get down for the trip. In 2 Corinthians 5.7 it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So we understand that there is something new in this nature. I, sorry? Okay. I'll just go back to point B again. Okay. When an unbeliever is born again, he or she receives a completely new nature. So that we know that that new nature comes from Jesus Christ himself. That's the source. That will always be the source. And, and that is where, we, where, we, where it comes from. Okay. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Important, that one is very critical to as, as, as we go forward. So when someone is born again, he receives a new nature, but the old nature is always there. So we are stuck with two natures, the old nature and the new nature. All right. I think I've kept everybody so far. The two natures within everybody are opposites. The old nature is wholly bad and the new nature is wholly good. Now some of you are starting to question that already. The old nature is wholly bad and the new nature is wholly good. Romans 7.18 says, For I know that in me, that is the flesh, nothing good dwells. Now it's hard for some of us to, who know ourselves before and after to think that there isn't some good in us before. But the Bible says that everything that we were before is not pleasing to God. And even the best part of you before was not pleasing to God. Otherwise, you didn't need Jesus Christ. So can we look at it that way? The old nature is wholly bad and the new nature is, is wholly good. All right. So the new nature, and when we read in that, we understand that God did not try and patch up the old nature. God gave us a completely new nature. He doesn't come in and try and fix up our old nature. And so God, when he gives us this new nature, gives us something completely new. That's why he says you're born again. You've got something new to follow and you've got the old to let go of. Okay? The new nature is divine because it comes from God. Its source is God and always will be God's. And the old nature is of the flesh and of us and is a carnal nature. That's why Paul calls it the actual carnal nature. One, one Peter, sorry, 2 Peter 1 4 says we are, we are partakers of the divine nature. So we have to choose whether we're going to walk in the old nature or be partakers of the new natures, which is divine. And so 
you'll find that the two natures by themselves, the way they are, bear two different types of fruit. And you'll find this uh, in Galatians chapter 5 and in verse 19 we'll see the acts of the old nature. It says the acts of the sinful nature and it goes on to list them. But then it goes on, you'll see that there is the, the, the fruit of the new nature, which is the fruit of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And he goes on to talk about those. So what you, sort of where you're coming from will depend on which nature will start to outflow from you. You'll either outflow things of the old nature or you'll outflow things of the Holy Spirit. Now, how do we treat these two natures? That they are treated totally differently. The old nature must be starved and the new nature must be fed. The Bible says in Romans 13, 14, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. In other words, you've got to cut it off. You've got to make some conscious effort uh, to make a choice to cut off the old and to feed the new nature and not feed the old nature. Okay? The old nature must be put off and the new nature must be put on. And you, you can read that uh, in Ephesians 4, 22 to 24. And again, it says uh, 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 in Colossians 3, 8 to 10, it says, put off concerning your former conduct the old man. So you've got a choice there. You can, you can leave it on or you can put it off. And Paul says you've got to put it off. Take off that filthy nature. Take off all that and put it off. But then he says that you've got to put on the new man which was created according to God in what? It says true righteousness and holiness. Now if you want to walk in true righteousness and holiness... You have to put on this new nature. And that's the only way it's going to happen. Number three, the old must be, sorry, must be counted as dead and the new as being alive. It says that this uh, in, uh, uh, I can't read it, sorry, uh, Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You have to live in the new nature if you are to follow Jesus Christ. And so we have to think of our old nature as completely dead. That's why we say we are crucified with Christ and that part of us has to die with that. If we continue on, we are trying to live in the old nature rather than walking in the newness of the life which Christ, you know, can get, which the, you know, Christ has given us and which the Holy Spirit will then lead us in. Now, why did Christ leave us with two natures? Ask that question because I don't like the old nature. Anyone here like it? I don't. It's a pain, a real pain. But if you think about it, God left us with, with two natures so that we would have a choice. If we had just the new nature, it would be pretty easy, wouldn't it? we just follow the Holy Spirit, got no other choice. But because we have a choice, we have a choice in how we love him and how we follow him and how we worship him. We had a choice when we came to him. We could either follow him or we could reject him. And it's no different for every day for the rest of your life. You have a choice whether you follow him or whether... You just cling to the old nature and cling to the old ways. So we have this problem, haven't we? And I said it's a big problem. We all know it's a big problem. But it gets more complicated. We have a problem because there's another difficulty which comes in. And that's the factor of the law and grace. And the law comes in, and we all know about the law, and the law is right through the New Testament, and the law is actually through the New Testament. But then we're told that we're no longer under the law, but we're under grace. And so as well as that, we have this complication. Now, Paul says in Romans 6, 14, For sin shall not, to have, sorry, sin shall not have a dominion over you, for you are not under the law, 
but you're under grace. Now Paul said this because he knew that he had come from one covenant into a new covenant. The old covenant was the covenant of the law. The new covenant is the covenant of grace and the covenant which Jesus Christ came and gave us. So that makes it even worse. Now we have an old nature, a new nature. We have the law and we have grace and we have the old covenant and we have the new covenant. You can see it gets complicated. And this confusion is where it all starts. It is something which has dogged me since I was a young Christian and even as a young boy when I followed God. This conflict between all these different things and how you deal with it. And I can tell you from here how you view these things will determine how you outwork your Christian walk, how you believe in in the cross, how you believe in, in, uh, in Jesus Christ, how you believe in your salvation, but not only that, how you outwork your sanctification and how you outwork your walk with him. And I can tell you people have different ideas about this. Now, everybody sees it differently and that is the problem. But we have to come to a point in understanding what we believe. Now, what I'm going to preach on in these subjects is what I believe. I've taken all my life to get to this point. How you take it is up to you. I, I can only say what I believe about these subjects and how you take them is between you and God. I'm not going to judge you from you know, sort of how you take those subjects because it's taken me a long time to get from where I was to where I am. And so, in the end, it ends up being something between you and God. What I ask you is that you don't make it something between you and me. If, you're, if you've got different ideas, that's fine. But don't try and force your ideas onto me. It's between you and God, how you think, how you act, and how you behave, and what you believe. But I'll give you the same warning I give myself, is that in the end we will be judged by what we have believed, who we have followed, and how we have walked our life. And that affects us even more if we are called to teach and to preach and to pass on that message because we'll be judged even, even harshly. So I take it very seriously about what I believe. And so what I'm telling you is what I believe. And if I'm wrong... And as someone said as one of our Bible studies, we can't all be right. Fair enough. Someone's got to be right. And there is, a, there, is a, there is a chance that I'm wrong. There is a chance that you're wrong. But you have to work it out in your own heart and in your own spirit and walk that walk with God because that's what he is going to judge you on, how you walked it. Okay, salvation and the law. We are taught that salvation comes by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. I haven't lost anybody there because I know we all believe that. All right. But what about before the cross? How were people saved before the cross? And I looked at that and looked at that and there's a pop, there's a popular misconception that in the Old Testament the people were saved by keeping the law. Well, that, I find, doesn't line up with scriptures. And in fact, when you read the New Testament, it contradicts that all the time. Galatians 3.11 says, But no man is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. So we can see by that statement that the law cannot justify you. Some will say, well, okay, this is only a New Testament I, you know, sort of concept. In the Old Testament, it was different. Well, I don't think it was different. In Habakkuk 2, 4, it says, Behold, the soul is puffed up. It is, not, it is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by faith. It's in the Old Testament. Okay. 
Now, Paul, when he teaches, and especially if you read Romans and Galatians, will talk about the law all the time. But the idea of the law, the law was, was given to the Jews and is given to us as a tutor. It's there to tell us that we are sinners. It's there like a big mirror so that we can see just how much of a sinner we are. If we didn't have the law, we wouldn't know how much of a sinner we were. And so the law was given in the Old Testament and is still there in the New so that we can judge where we are as far as being a sinner or not. All right? So, but the law was only given for that reason, for no other reason. It was not given so that man could justify himself by it. It was given to show man just how much of a sinner he was to drive him to the only person that could set him free, and that was God. Because in God is found the answer to salvation and not the law. In Romans uh, 3.20 it says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. There we have the reason for the law. It is so that we have a knowledge of our sin. And that's why it's there. And that's why it, it will always be there. But Jesus came not to get rid of the law, but to fulfill the law. In other words, he said he's going to take the law, fulfill it, and then put the laws into our hearts so that in our hearts we are moving away from breaking the law. Romans chapter 4, Paul goes on to talk about how people were saved in the Old Testament. And in Romans 3, sorry, Romans 4, number 3, he talks about Abraham. And he says, where are we? For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed in God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And that's even before the law. 400 years before Moses, God accounted righteousness to Abraham, not because of what he did, because if you, if you, if you follow Abraham, he did a lot of things that were wrong. It was accredited to him that he trusted in God and had faith in God. And that's how he was, that's how he was saved. And in Romans 4, 6, he then talks about David and the character of David. It says, just as David also, uh, also describes the, the, uh, the blessedness of a man to whom God imputes righteousness, but then it goes and says, apart from works. Now, we all know about the sins of David. He was quite a sinner. He failed time and time again. But yet David had faith that God could save him from the very sins that he was committing and did commit. That was his hard attitude. When he made a mistake, he ran straight to God because he knew God had the answer to his sin and that salvation would come through David. So, yeah, uh, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, yeah, to David, uh, yeah, through God. And they all look forward to this coming Messiah Job, which is the oldest book in the Bible, and they reckon it was the first book ever written. Even Job says, my Redeemer lives. Here's a man in utter misery for something that he didn't do, wondering whether he, he was a sinner, being told he is a sinner and all sorts of things. And yet he pointed to his Redeemer. He knew that he would be redeemed by God even though he couldn't understand why all those things were happening to him. This is what saved people in the Old Testament. Yes, they had the law and they tried to fulfill the law and they had all these ceremonies that they had to do and that was good, but it did not save them. It was their heart attitude in coming to God that he would save them, not the sacrifice, not the law. And so that is the Old Testament salvation. The cross... We heard it again this morning. Jesus cried out three words. It is finished. Those are the three most powerful words that I have ever heard 
in my life because it changed my life. It is finished. But how you take those words will determine about how you see the cross and how you walk beyond the cross. It will determine how you believed in him. You either thought he was a liar or he, he, was, he was telling the truth and you chose to believe and you came to him. You understood that when he, when he hung there and he said those words, that sin was forgiven, that your past was forgiven and it made a way through for you to be able to come to him. But understand also that beyond the cross, we walk in the shadow of the cross going forward. And those words to me are just as, as important as, as they were when I came to him. It is finished. So in other words, to me, the cross cut off everything from my past. But how you walk your Christian walk will depend on how you see that. The cross, when it was done, acts like a line drawn through the, all of history. It divides mankind into before and after. It divides you into a person before and after. You, before you didn't believe, now you did believe. It divides between people. It divides between beliefs. Some people do not think that Jesus Christ is the only way. And yet the cross says he is the only way. And it stands and it cuts across everything. And it cuts across you, it cuts across your soul, it cuts, it cuts across your mind, and it cuts across your spirit. And we have to see the cross as doing that. Otherwise we are still joined to the past. It divides between the old and the new covenant. And some people will say, well, hang on, no, we've still got the old covenant because we've still got the law. Yes, we've still got the law, but after the cross, the law was fulfilled. And we have to understand that that's why Jesus came. He came to fulfill the law so that we could walk the same way as he walked, that the law would not be our master and hold us bondage, and sin would not be our master and hold us bondage, but he came to set us free. He who the Son sets free is free indeed. And the cross of Jesus Christ says that over and over again. The question is, for all of us, where do we walk? A lot of people will walk under the law and not grace. And yet Jesus Christ constantly calls us to walk under grace and to follow him. Paul was frustrated, as I said, with the law. He was frustrated with being this, 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 you know, this, this, this whole new man. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He knew the law, he kept the law, and he did everything he could. And now he was this new man and he was worse off because he was frustrated. He says, O wretched man that I am, whom shall deliver me from this body of death? He wanted out. He wanted to find a way out. Now, Paul knew and loved the law. As I said, he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. That means he would have known the law better than anybody here. He knew it inside out, every, every dot, every comma, every full stop. He knew it all. He knew the law. He tried to keep it all. He was passionate. He used to kill Christians because of the law. And Paul struggled with it. And he was looking for the answer. And he was trying to get this answer over to people. Now, I want to ask you the question, where did Paul point people to find the answer? And that's where, that's where we start to differ about different things. Where did Paul turn, turn to? Did he, did he turn to the law? He didn't turn to the law. He turned to Jesus Christ and he turned to the Holy Spirit. And if you read further on after in Romans 7, in verse 25, he said, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. He knew that Jesus was the answer to this struggle within him and the struggle he was having with the law. 
And then he goes on, you know, two verses later in, in chapter 8, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus and who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. There he pointed to the answer as to how to fix things. Now people, I have been in a church that took me back under the law. I know what it was like for 10 years to walk under the law. And a lot of people when they come into their Christianity seem to end up in churches that like to promote the law. And the law is a good thing. But trying to promote people to try and keep it is not the real way of doing it. We need to point people constantly to Jesus Christ and to point them to the Holy Spirit as the way to be able to live and to fulfill the law. And this is the thing which Paul was struggling with. Now, I know some of you have come out of similar churches to you know, you know, you know, where, where I came from. You've been under the law and you've tried to fulfill the law. There are people even here within our, our congregation that think the cross didn't cut off everything. They think that the cross cut off some things, but there are some things like curses which can hold somebody to the past. Now, I don't believe that. And I don't believe that because every time I look in the New Testament for the answer, I cannot find anybody pointing me back to the law. Everything in the New Testament points me forward to Jesus Christ and to the Holy Spirit. And so it might talk about these things in the Old Testament, but nothing in the New Testament points me back to that. And so constantly I have to come back to what it says in the New Testament and live by that and not others. God always directs us forward and not backwards. And that's why I talked about the race in running and we keep on pushing ourselves forward into the things of God, letting go of what is behind us and grabbing hold of the things which God is opening up for us day by day in the things of the Spirit. Because if we don't, we start to look for answers behind us rather than up in front of us and I've been there and I've tried it in Galatians Paul was speaking to a church that had gone back under the law in Galatians 5.25 he says if we live in the spirit let us walk in the spirit and Paul goes back on and to warn them he said oh foolish Galatians now to call someone foolish is not a good thing for a Jew to do and we shouldn't do it either. And yet Paul is saying, you foolish people, what have you done? Who has bewitched you? In other words, who, who, has, who has put this lie into you to go looking backwards for your answers? And he says, goes on to says, before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. In other words, it's finished. And yet they, because they had come out of the law, decided they were going to go back and try and live their life partly under the law. Why am I saying this? Because Paul goes on to say, and I've read this just a while ago in Galatians 2.20 to 21, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God for the righteousness comes through the law. Sorry, if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. And Paul goes on to say in, 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 in 3.12, the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. In other words, if you want to live in the law, go for it. But he said, you've got to pick up every one of them. Now, there's 650-something laws. That's what he was saying to them. You've been set free from all of that. If you want to go and live by one or two of them, fine, but you're going to find you're going to end up living by all of them again. This is the difference between law and grace. And it is a touchy subject. People, I came out of a church, as I've just said, which I was under the law for 10 years. And I struggled because I love God to try and keep every one of those laws. And if you come out of a Catholic church, you know what the law is all about. I'll guarantee that. It will, it will, you'll come under condemnation day in, day out. 
and they'll make you walk every law and you'll go to confession and you'll do this and you'll do that but you know what you're not free you're under the bondage of the law and they've they tell you you are free because God has saved you and yet in the very same breath they put you back under the law and you're trapped there and you struggle and you struggle I tried and I tried and I tried and I failed and I failed and I failed and I failed so much I became so frustrated with trying to do it I gave up on the law I gave up on the church and I gave up on God at the same time or well, that version of God, what I thought was God. It took God 20 years to get me back to even looking at Christianity. But when I came back to Christianity, I knew one thing. I could not fulfill the law. And the only reason I came to the cross was that I was told I was no longer under the law, but under grace. I was told that I could not do it in my own strength, but because of the strength of Jesus Christ, there was a way in which I could fulfill the law by following him. And that's made all the difference because I knew I'd been there and tried it all and I'd got so frustrated with it. And so when someone comes up to me and says, it's, you've, you've got to go back and do this, or it hasn't been finished by the cross, I say, I can't. I know where you're coming from, but I can't go back to where you're at. If you want to stay there, fine. I didn't want to stay there. And it worries me that if you want to stay there, that you're going to end up frustrated like me and getting angry with yourself and getting angry with God. Because once you start to live by the law, you start to find the answers in the law and not in the Holy Spirit. And you see, I, I, I can't do that. And so if we differ in these areas, it's up to you. Don't make it something between you and I. I know where I stand before Jesus Christ and I know where I stand in regard to the Holy Spirit. I love the law, but I know in my own strength I will never fulfill the law. Paul struggled, didn't he? And I'm going to talk about walking in the Spirit next time and how do we deal with these struggles. He became so frustrated sometimes and he cried out to God once, take this from me. Three times he cried out, take it from me. Where did God point him? Back to the law again? No. He pointed him back to grace. He said there, my grace is sufficient for you for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Now people... You can try, if you're a strong person, to live by the law. I am not a strong person, and I cannot live by the law. The best I can do is try and follow the Holy Spirit, try and follow my Lord and Saviour, and try and fulfil his law. And that's what I want to speak about next time. How do we walk in the Spirit? How do we let go of one nature and walk in the other nature? And it's not an easy walk. The Bible says that the road is narrow. It's not an easy way. It's a lot easier to go back and walk the easier path. It's a lot harder to trust the Holy Spirit that he's going to bring you through things. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I know we're all here at different stages and we see different things. But Father, I value so much the freedom of your Holy Spirit. Not that I can do whatever I want to do, but just the opposite, Lord, that it brings me to a place where I can surrender into you and surrender my weaknesses. But I pray for others, Lord, that you would help them to see the, the power of the cross, help them to see the, the, the magnitude of what you have done, help them to see the power of the Holy Spirit, not just in signs and wonders, Lord, but in actually allowing the Holy Spirit to sanctify and change their life and make them that new creation. So, Lord, I just leave it with you. For those that have upset, Lord, I, I know that you will you know, sort these things out down the track. But, Lord, I know that there is a, there is a, there is a purpose in this time that you want to release your, your Holy Spirit in a very, very special way. And we need to be that people that are walking in your spirit, 
in every possible way. And so, Heavenly Father, I just commit it to you because of my Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord.